Welcome to the Dash Arts Podcast, seeing the world through an artistic lens. I'm Josephine Burton, Artistic Director of Dash Arts. And welcome to our general election special edition of this podcast. We were actually going to have the summer off so we could focus on the development of Dash's productions, including our State of the Nation theatre production, Our Public House. But then, on a cold and wet Wednesday in May, Rishi Sunak got soaked outside Downing Street. Earlier today, I spoke with His Majesty the King to request the dissolution of Parliament. The King has granted this request and we will have a general election on the 4th of July. This election will take place at a time when the world is more dangerous than it has been since the end of the Cold War. It sparked a flurry of speeches and debates across the country with politicians demanding our attention. So here it is, the future of the country in your hands. On the 4th of July, you have the choice and together we can stop the chaos We can turn the page. We can start to rebuild Britain and change our country. In our speech-making workshops, we've been working with participants from across England to create provoking, persuasive and empowering speeches about things they feel passionate about and what they felt needed to change. We work with diverse communities, including schools, women's prisons, men's social groups, political activists and deaf communities. In every workshop, we introduced our participants to a clear structure to help them craft and then deliver a speech. It had a a sort of template that took us from the introduction where our participants got to talk about their own personal way into the issue. And then the narrative, which was the context for uh, what was really going on that was driving the thing that they wanted to change. The proof, which became the argument, like what was the thing that was going to change not just their lives, but make everybody else's lives better. And then the refutation, which is the sort of the counter counter argument when you anticipate what someone might be listening, might think, and and you kind of put in the the, the argument that's going to win them over. And then finally, a conclusion, which was like the rousing end to the speech. Our colleagues, Alan Finlayson, Professor of Political and Social Theory at the University of East Anglia, and Henrietta van der Blum from the University of Birmingham delivered the workshops with us. We'll leave the speeches here, yeah? And my colleagues from the theatre will help you do all that in the best way possible. Yeah, yeah, yeah you, can, you can wrap it all up, yeah? But you'll learn these... That, that, that we'll call, I should, actually, I'll tell you what, I'll tell you this, yeah? So we have... My colleague Henrietta here is actually a specialist in the study of ancient Rome and ancient Roman oratory, you know, gladiators and... All that sort of stuff, yeah? Julius Caesar. And Julius Caesar. Was a brilliant orator. And what you've actually been doing and what you've been writing is the structure of the Roman classical oration. It's the kind of speech they gave in ancient Rome when they wanted to kind of rile everyone up, whether it was to go to war or to not go to war or to spend more money on the bread and circuses for the people, right? So it's 2,000 and a bit years old, this kind of style of speech, right? And I think you, you'll find that it does help give a kind of order to what you're saying and help it make, make it clear to people. So think about yourselves being like ancient Romans declaiming in the kind of ancient assemblies of Italy. Yeah? That's what you're going to be doing. Okay? Can, and I, you're going can to... I, I ask before we have lunch and just help us for our planning for this afternoon? Because would everyone like a bit more time writing before we start? This? Yes, mind, please. The speeches were phenomenally diverse, ranging from a campaign for mushroom burials to increasing universal credit and rent controls to easy access to music lessons, improved special needs education and support for those people with mental health challenges. In Norwich, we'd hear about the challenges of the cost of living crisis and we'd also hear that in Manchester and we would be down in Cornwall listening to people talking about the challenges of special needs education and then we'd hear the same thing in Oxfordshire it was a phenomenal insight into the fact that there were local issues driving people and their calls for action but often uh, people across the country are being faced by similar challenges I wanted to take this opportunity to bring some of those participants back from across England for this special episode I hosted a virtual round table and was joined by Devika who we met in East London and Johnny who we worked with in Coventry so uh, actually the thing is like uh, the rhetorical structure of the political speeches that we learned that day with um, Alan and Henrietta, uh, 
I was actually like, um, you know, observing like uh, how the uh, politicians and the political candidates, they are using it in their speeches. And I was also able to understand like, you know, how they, you know, mask their true intentions through like um, flowery words and rhetorics and, you know, how they employ them so effectively. Even I realized like uh, I could also do that. Uh, or I could rather be honest about what I think, uh, what I feel, and what my opinion is. And um, rather not be like, you know, scared and terrified of, you know, not saying that or voicing my opinion. So I think um, workshops have helped me a lot with that, at least. So, yeah, much more confident in uh, so speaking about stuff. And uh, I think uh, being part of this podcast also like um, highlights that confidence I have developed now over these workshops. I had the sense of feeling like I can see through exactly what you're trying to do to us. Uh, like um, you can't like, you know, pull wool over my eyes. I can see what you're doing. I mean, I can see if you're doing it like this or doing it like that. So I I don't know. I suddenly felt um, like empowered in that sense. Like, you know, I had a better understanding of what's going on. To be honest, that's what I felt like, you know, once I understood the structure of the speeches, I understood how you can make a speech as persuasive as possible. Like even the uh points or the principles that you normally won't agree with suddenly you might agree with just because of hearing that speech workshops have helped me with the ability to open a narrative with certain people and um to realize what people actually want to have a conversation and what people just want to argue their point for the sake of arguing so it's given me the ability as well to uh put into words my point without coming across a bit too pushy and actually start the argument i don't mind a heated debate but when it's just a, an argument for the sake of pushing a viewpoint across and not actually learning anything, then that, yeah, I don't like that. So it's it's given me the ability to, to put views across in a, a certain way which doesn't cause an argument. But if it sparks a debate, then it sparks a debate, which I do enjoy. Kate from our workshops in Norwich and Max over in Cornwall also joined us. Yeah, I think it had an effect on everybody who went, certainly that I know. And we learned some new games. <laughs> we keep playing all the same games. We learned another new game last night, which is, was just mind-bending. A whole load of menopausal women couldn't cope with it, I'm afraid, for the first time. But we might get it. <laughs> it's definitely changed the way I listen to people doing public speaking. But now that we've been through this, it's given me the tools to, I wouldn't say fight back, but sort of keep constantly checking that I'm not like being lulled into a false sense of security and allowing sort of my emotions to be manipulated because I'm because I can listen to a speech now and at least at the bare, bare bones notice how it's been put together it means I can approach it from an analytical standpoint rather than simply an emotional one with so many speeches and hustings taking place around the country, we thought that we'd go back to the moment it all kicked off at the end of May and zone in on the speeches that Rishi Sunak and Keir Starmer gave that day. In the last five years, our country has fought through the most challenging times since the Second World War. Tonight, the Prime Minister has finally announced the next general election, a moment the country needs and has been waiting for. Inspired by Henrietta and Allen, we've used Aristotelian principles of analysing speechmaking. Logos, the words and the argument in your speech. These uncertain times call for a clear plan and bold action to chart a course to a secure future. You must choose in this election who has that plan, who is prepared to take the bold action necessary to secure a better future. A chance to change for the better. Your future your community, your country. Now, it will feel like a long campaign, I'm sure of that. But no matter what else is said and done, that opportunity for change is what this election is about. Ethos, the credibility and the authority with which you deliver the speech. And when I introduced the furlough scheme, I did so not because I saw a country simply in need of desperate help, albeit we were but because I saw a country whose future hung in the balance. Look around our country, the sewage in our rivers, people waiting on trolleys in A&E, crime virtually unpunished, mortgages and food prices through the roof. It's all, every bit of it, a direct result 
of the Tory chaos in Westminster. Now is the moment for Britain to choose its future, to decide whether we want to build on the progress we have made or risk going back to square one with no plan and no certainty. And pathos, the way you appeal to your audience's emotions. I have never and will never leave the people of this country to face the darkest of days alone. And you know that because you've seen it. Service of our country is the reason and the only reason why I am standing here now asking for your vote. Country first, party second. Let's start with Logos, the content. Now I cannot and will not claim that we have got everything right. No government should. But I am proud of what we have achieved together, the bold actions we have taken, and I'm confident about what we can do in the future. We've tackled inflation, controlled debt, cut workers' taxes, and increased the state pension by £900. OK, there's a lot of really terrible, <laughs> terrible political speak things. Bold action. Bold action, like as if that is enough. Yeah, that's telling, not showing, right? That's washing powder does that. Don't, don't tell me you're going to do tough, bold action. Ridiculous. I do find it really frustrating and annoying. I mean, some of that is structure, but mo an awful lot of it is content. It's just a list of him keep saying nothing, basically. Keep, keep saying nothing. His whole section, which was a list of things that they're going to do, was all about being bold. That's all he said. We're going to be bold. And then we're going to be bold. We're going to be bold. And we're going to be bold. And then well, there was a section saying, we are, we, we've been bold. We've been bold. We've been bold. And the things he did say he'd done were just blatantly not true. And I find that so frustrating that I've been um, throwing things at the screen. But more broadly, as a kind of political analysis, which is what I would more generally do, you can see what the attempt was so a general election is a question okay and the question is would appear to be you know who's, who's going to be prime minister what party is going to lead but actually no that's not the question that's the answer right the answer is this party that party this person that person what's the question and so part of the dispute in any election campaign is over what the question is who do we need to get Brexit done? Who will it, you know? How will we address the economic crisis? Whatever it is, yeah. What kind of you know, what kind of person do we need for this present situation that we find ourselves in? So part of a political speech and a rhetorical performance is trying to perform a character and define a situation, so that people are going, oh yeah, that's right. In this case, oh yeah, what we need is security. What we need is someone who will protect us. And so Sudak comes out with, hey, I protected you in COVID. I helped secure the economy during COVID. I'm a protector. I can offer security. I've made things stable in the economy. It's a dangerous world. The Russians are out there. There are extremists who want to divide us. But I can bring about stability and make you feel secure and that's i think that's actually quite a very clear pitch that he makes and but against that his reading doesn't make him feel like a decisive secure person who's going to protect us made worse by the fact that he's outdoors getting rained on with music in the background so the 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 physical circumstances of the performance are at odds with the message that he's trying to put forward and there's an unclarity as well because he switches between his character, who will keep you secure, and trying to kind of praise us, the British people. I know when we work together, we can do great things. And that's a bit unclear. Hang on, you just told us that you, you kept us safe. <laughs> uh, what's going on here? So the whole thing is a bit of a mess, I would say, intellectually and ideologically as well. Um, and then that sets them up. To, for their attempt to say, look, you don't know who Keir Starmer is. Don't take the risk. Don't take the leap. You don't know. It. They'll keep you secure. They'll just do whatever they think is to their advantage in the short term, which was clearly going to be their strategy for the election, but got knocked off pretty quickly and was always at odds with their return with their alternative argument, which was, oh, when Starmer gets in, actually, he'll turn out to be some kind of communist and he'll you know, subject you to vicious taxation and oppress you. 
So they were never quite clear about that. And I think that's that's indicative of their campaign as a whole, right? They weren't quite clear what the... There's an attempt to set up a story. Here's where we came from. Here's where we are now. Here's where we're going. But it never quite works. Here's where we came from. It was terrible that I kept you safe. Here's where we are now. Well, there's all these kind of threats. So in the future, I'll keep you safe still. Well, hang on a minute. That's not that's not the third act in a story. That's returning us to act one. Give me the picture and tell me how you're going to be part of that picture and how I can believe that you are the embodiment of that. And it doesn't quite, it doesn't pull off. I, it doesn't pull it off, I would say. More money into HS2. We set out a comprehensive plan to reform our welfare system, to make it fair for those who pay for it as well as those who need it. Immigration is finally coming down and we are stopping the boats with our Rwanda partnership. And we will ensure that the next generation grows up smoke-free. Because we have a long-term plan to rebuild Britain. A plan that is ready to go, fully costed and fully funded. We can deliver economic stability, cut the NHS waiting times, secure our borders with a new border security command, harness great British energy to cut your bills for good. Tackle antisocial behaviour. They sort of essentially sound like, again, both of them have got a speech written out in front of them and lots of the refutations they're throwing back at each other seem to be quite repetitive. Um, ultimately, both of them, so both of the major parties seem to be stuck in this loop of weirdly saying the same thing where they're both saying, like, we've got this great plan, we're striving forward, don't listen to the other guys, they'll make it turn into chaos. And neither of them are really elaborating on why specifically they are right and the other guys are wrong. So it's sort of, I feel like if I turn on the radio halfway through a debate, it would take me a good couple minutes to work out who's on which party. And if you look at the manifestos from the parties, they do have policies in there that are wildly different from each other. I just don't hear any of them talking about it. Both parties, are, you know, they, they, they tend to focus mainly on things like the NHS and jobs, etc. Um, and again, that, is, that, that seems to be something that as a country, people tend to complain about um, and make statements upon. Um, like the NHS isn't funded enough, there aren't enough jobs. That you know, a lot of people. I mean, in um, Rishi's statement, he was saying about no, sorry, not Rishi's statement, Keir's um, statement saying about uh, protecting borders and stuff like that, which you know would link to a lot of people's I ideas of where what jobs um, will or won't be available. Next up, the ethos. We discuss what we thought about their delivery because it's time for change. Our offer is to reset both our economy and our politics so that they once again serve the interests of working people. We totally reject the Tory view that economic strength is somehow gifted from those at the top. Over the past 14 years, through all the crises we've had to face, sticking with that idea has left our country exposed, insecure and unable to unlock the potential of every community. But a vote for Labour is a vote to turn the page on all that. So the delivery is better, clearly. I mean, he's, he's evidently worked on that for a long time. I think Starmer has a problem with his voice, right? I know that sounds like a superficial thing to say, but he does, doesn't he? It needs to slightly kind of change pitch. But he was doing quite a good job of, of, of giving some kind of dramatic emphasis and not sounding like he was reading all the time, which he was not making a, you know, an everyday conversational style, which wouldn't quite work. So that works. And he clearly is kind of uh, the staging is much better for him to perform the role of, of British political leader, the stage setting and all the background and the way in which he's doing it is all for that. In terms of structure as a speech, I think it's also a better structured speech, although not perfectly structured. It, it, it's the easier gig, right? So it's the easier speech to give because it's the story is simpler. The story is like, here's, here's what we've had in the past and here's how, where, where we are in the present. It's all a bit of a rubbish, isn't it? So let's, let's change where we are now and then in the future it'll be better. That's all he's got to do. And that's easier than, you know, oh, it was terrible in the past, but I helped you. So let's not do anything different now. Um, but that story, I think, gets slightly um, kind of lost at times because it's 
peppered in there are all these buzz phrases that are, that are a key part of the Labour strategy, right? Uh, p- country first, then party, uh, the interest service, the interests of working people. And I'm not sure what the function of those is, if they are meant to kind of trigger different constituencies that traditional Labour people will go, oh, yes, service of working people, that's who we are. Is that for them? Service, well, who is that for? I'm not I'm not entirely sure where that all goes. But what I'm most interested in in that speech, and actually it is a sort of evidence of the way in which the Labour Party campaign has been more focused, is the phrase he uses, well, several times he talks about stop the chaos. So what he's doing there, like we said earlier with Sunak, He's making he's making the question of the election, yeah, you know, center on this chaos, yeah. So we have to, you know, everything is wrong because it's chaos. So the the answer becomes stop the chaos, <laughs> yeah. And so all you've got to do is okay, yeah, we can stop the chaos by getting rid of these guys. So that's that's how the election gets framed. Just stop the chaos. Uh, but what he does is he also says there, stop the chaos, turn the page. And that that phrase runs throughout the manifesto. It's repeated continually in the manifesto. It appears at the end of every policy section. Stop the chaos, turn the page. It's a really fascinating metaphor, I think. I mean, that's the kind of thing I say, right? <laughs> Metaphors are fascinating. We can talk about them for ages, yeah. But it's a weird one, right? Because, you know, it's so often, often political metaphors are journeys. You know, we're on a ship. <laughs> we're traveling through history. Uh, it's a big adventure. Or it's um, often their their buildings, you know, we're building a house, fixing the roof, securing the foundations, all this sort of stuff. So the turn the page one is kind of unusual. And but what's particularly unusual about it is that that it stops there. We'll turn the page. What's on the next page? It's it's a blank page. And it's trying to make a virtue of that blank page. Yeah. This kind of openness. That's the kind of thing it wants to to get. But I don't think it quite captures the mood you might want if what you were really saying was look, let, look let's just take this leap let's get let's stop this chaos let's turn the page and who knows what we'll find but it will be exciting it, it can't quite do that so when it gets to trying to say what's on there you get the rather blank bit you, the rather bland bits about um you know the, the citing kind of manifesto facts and figures that you know we'll do this we'll get all these people on the health service which it becomes a little bit less convincing but structurally, it seems to me that it, it, it very tightly fits the structure that we've been teaching people. It sets things up. It tells us about the situation. And there's a, there's a slightly dull bit in the middle, which is all the, the evidence. <laughs> we'll do this. We've got a policy for this. We've got a policy for that. Um, skips over the refutation bit. Oh, I don't agree. Do these days. I don't agree, actually. I, I, the thing that What's I, the refutation? I, I think, you see, because Rishi's refutation is the Labour's going to be terrible, right, in his first one. Yes. Labour will be terrible, so you've got to trust us. What I think is really interesting is 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 he Keir's, Keir's refutation is, I'm aware of the cynicism out there. Okay. And, yeah, and yeah. you know, so I'm not fighting you. the cynicism. He's fighting the people who don't think politics are... Um, are sincere and actually mean what they're saying and so his thing is i'm you know a decent person i worked in public service and that's the thing you know that's the that's the counter argument and i and i find it okay that's the better reading than i had yeah well i find it quite that's the bit where... that he thinks that like actually what he knows in that moment that the competition the threat for him not getting into power isn't the tories it's people not being bothered to come out to vote or just thinking, oh well, it's, you know, you don't want the super majority. Like the new thing is the super majority, right? Yeah. Uh, but so I think it's quite fascinating. Or to me, in that moment, he's already called. He's already realised he knows he's going to win. If yeah, he's so that's the bit where it shifts, isn't it, to being more about him and I. Yeah. Probably if we went back and looked, I wonder, I wonder if there's a bit where the I, the we, shifts to the I, and that's the bit where he's where he, puts himself in the centre, you can you can trust me. In I think it might be there. I actually wrote down, I'm aware of the cynicism. I think I didn't write I at all before that moment. So yes, I think it's then. Yeah. I'm the saviour. Yes, and I'm, I didn't notice that because my cynicism got in the way. <laughs> this speech was for you, Alan. <laughs> <laughs> then, just as we were recovering from COVID, war returned to Europe. With Putin's invasion of Ukraine sending your energy bills spiralling, I came to office, above all, to restore economic stability. Economic stability is the bedrock of any future success, whether that is rising wages and good jobs, investment in our public services, or the defence of the country. I've seen you give people advice, 
in quite a short space of time that has, that has totally transformed their delivery, uh, which is why it surprises me that his delivery is so flat. That means either they haven't got it together to give him training or he thinks he's brilliant and doesn't want to listen. I don't know. Um, but also I think because what you tell people to do in a sense is to, you know, to not be confined by the script to also be sort of speaking as themselves to perform themselves, I suppose you could say. Yeah. And, and I guess you can, I guess you can fake that people learn to fake that. Right. But that can also come from being confident that the core of the argument is, is right. And, and having a grasp of the core of the argument so that even if you forget the actual lines, you know the through line, the story, and the reasons that you're bringing to your argument because you're solid in that and you really feel that and you believe that. And I think that gives people a confidence and a, a, an ability to to sound more like they're thinking about it, to sound like it's coming not quite off the cuff, but they're they're thinking as they go along and they've got a lot in their head that they can draw on. And, and uh, yeah, Sunak doesn't have that. You know, some statements that Sunak made, I felt like uh, he's becoming a little bit like, you know, aggressive and, you know, like direct out and, uh, you know, just, you know, directly attacking the uh, Labour Party. Uh, like uh, there was one uh, particular statement that he made, like, you know, do you want uh, someone who's like uh, going to do literally anything, find the easy way out rather than someone who is like, you know, uh, thinking of every single thing and, you know, making sure that the country is as stable and balanced as possible. So I, th- I think um, he, w- he was being a little bit more, you know, aggressive in his uh, style of speech. It comes back to something Max said earlier about how he gets the impression when he's listening that they've just got to get this all in and the programme's got a time frame and all that sort of thing. And because of this business that they think we've got an attention span of the maligned goldfish and we can't concentrate for very long, they want to keep the programme moving the other general thought is, in terms of the deliveries, I agree. I, I, I just don't believe him. I just think he's, he feels, I never quite believe that he's sincere. I think he, you know, he could do with some better training, but I also just don't, well, you know, I, then you start questioning, well, maybe he really is insincere. Maybe, maybe he's spending his whole time going, kind of double thinking himself, going, why am I in this situation? <laughs> why didn't I stay in California? <laughs> What am I doing? Can't believe I'm prime minister. I mean, another dimension of this, which we haven't talked about in a whole other area, is that the trouble is they these speeches that we're watching and we're treating them as sort of almost kind of intimate occasions that were that were for us. Yeah, you know, they know perfectly well that these are going to be recorded, clipped, recirculated, you know, put into different contexts. So that part of what happens is they for them a win is not saying anything that can be used against them rather than actually convincing anybody, as long as we don't do something that can be held against us. And of course, we've seen over the campaign, people say things that have been clipped and used against them. So there's a kind of timidity that is induced uh, in the, the speech making, which is a kind of com- to do with the kind of complex way in which the speech, the audience of the speech is really very ambiguous. One of the things we teach people is to think about the audience you're talking to and what do they need to hear? What do they need to know? What do they need to understand? But if you're outside Downing Street with a, with 100 cameras in front of you who is the audience is it the people is it the people holding those cameras or the editors who's actually going to see it so you end up with this okay I'll just try and give a vague appearance in a few phrases and that will be enough and as long as they can't show me on the telly looking stupid with covered in soaking wet from the rain um, it'll be okay and finally the pathos did we, as the audience, really believe them? And did we care enough? Country first, party second. A rejection of the gesture politics you will see in this campaign, I have no doubt, from the Tories and the SNP. I'm well aware of the cynicism people hold towards politicians at the moment. But I came into politics late, having served our country as leader of the Crown Prosecution Service. And I helped the police service in Northern Ireland to gain the consent of all... On the 5th of July, either Keir Starmer or I will be Prime Minister. He has shown time and time again that he will take the easy way out and do anything to get power. If he was happy to abandon all the promises he made to become Labour leader once he got the job, how can you know that he won't do exactly the same thing if he were to become Prime Minister? 
if you don't have the conviction it's run as a business um same as america with you know past presidents that, that we shan't name um running things as a business and until they start seeing you know the people for the people and not just as um working parts in their whole system then we're i don't think we're going to get uh, i mean any but i don't think we're going to get anywhere um i think that no matter who gets voted in it, it's the whole thing with power corrupts the, the incredible refreshing wonderful thing about working with all the people we work with around the country were in the writing and crafting of a speech was that there was you were able to bring a personal anecdote to the introduction like you know the reason why it means something to you and you brought yourself and then you and when you delivered that speech it felt incredibly it felt like I was encountering you and the passion of you in that moment and then obviously the work we did around thinking about um delivering that was exactly looking at how can you bring yourself to the speech and and I and I think that says it's just an enormously it's such an it's so important it's how we you know we listening to those speeches feel hear those moments empathize with you in that moment and then go on the journey as you try and tell us why the thing that you want to change will be important for me too I am there every time every single speech I've heard um, I am mindful that, you know, the politicians who are doing these speech campaign pitches day in, day out must really struggle with bringing themselves every day. You know, how many times can you bring yourself to tell a story, tell everybody that you're the son of a toolmaker without it beginning to feel a bit insincere? I think especially when the, the only relatable thing Rishi Sunak has said is that he couldn't afford Sky TV. I feel, we've got such little material to draw to go on. I, I I don't know how he does it. I don't know how he manages to empathise with so many people. A lot of people who I talk to who but back Rishi or think that he's the um the person for the job don't. Re I feel like they're again talking about action rather than specifically who he is because it's very hard to get a gauge on the man. Um because there's very little he can bring out as an anecdote that isn't wildly sort of of a different world than the population. Yeah, well, that's true, of course, isn't it? I mean, that is absolutely true of many of them. And I, I think that Keir Starmer definitely scores there because he's only one generation away from being, you know, he grew up in not poverty, but he grew up in a very working class, you know, lower middle class household. And um, whereas, yeah, Rishi Sunak is, um, just lives in a different world, doesn't he? A completely different world. The amount of wealth that he and his family and his wife's family have are just you know, more than a small country. I chaired a hustings yesterday for candidates where I live. And we had sourced questions from people beforehand. Um, and one of the ones we didn't get to, unfortunately, but I rather liked it. Someone just wanted to ask the candidates, um, what will you do to improve our community? And what are you doing now? And I thought that was a really interesting question, just a straightforward, like, what are you doing in the community? Because people could then say, and, and then they might say, well, I'm working in this business. And that would tell us about their sense of the community. Or they might say, I work for this charity and that would give a different sense and we might judge those or they might say i don't know who knows what they might tell us in in, in a way you kind of want to know are you you know are you a do you go to your you know kids football matches and help help clean the football kit i don't know i think that would be quite interesting for that stuff to come out um and that's not something that i think a journalist with no disrespect to journalists would ever ask or it would become some kind of Ross slightly naff kind of like humanize the can the candidate i don't know i'd like to know that or even you know i'm not saying ask them what their favorite color is but you know but something like that makes sense kind of course and it goes back to a real sense of the origins of the word politics right polis the like the town the community like you we're doing the we're looking after our town yes and, and, and it's partly because you know the judgment we make of candidates is partly about policy and manifesto sure but a lot, a lot of it is really about character, what kind of people we think they are. Uh, and in the UK, for various reasons, 
um, part of elite opinion has settled on the fact that part, a necessary part of the character of a leader is a willingness to uh, fire nuclear weapons at people or willingness to say that you'll fire nuclear weapons at people, which I find quite a weird little thing that something's evolved that we need, we, we need to ask that question because that's something to do with security and we'll feel safe if the candidate can say that they will hypothetically do this. OK, fine. But I'd like to ask other hypothetical questions about what they would do in certain circumstances and get a feel for who they who they really are. The interesting thing about the emotional um, conclusion that lots of my peers have come to is that they have reached this emotional belief in not voting at all. Um, so lots of people in my generation sort of this would be our first election but many people feel like there's not a point in trying and so more often than debating against political views i disagree with i've had to debate with people that it's worth even putting your name on a ballot um which is a really weird position to find yourself in uh but it's because people have reached that like after feeling like they've not been listened to for so many years the emotional state they're in is one of like complete shutdown from politics. Lack of engagement, and we have to find a way to engage more people. And certainly people should be looking into how we can change our elections to do that. I mean, we had a go at it with, with the European elections, didn't we, when we were involved with that? And nobody, there wasn't, the, you know, the roof didn't fall in. Nobody objected particularly. Well, it's it's back to the apathy stuff we were talking about earlier. I I think it's difficult because you kind of want to, well, obviously you don't, but you want to grab these people by the shoulders and say, don't you see you have, you've been given the power to change, right? You, this is the opportunity to do something about all the stuff you've been complaining about, but for whatever reason, they just can't see that that is what is happening. It's the same problem with like if you talk about any issue in politics. Like this is the same, the same argument we get with climate change, isn't it? Right? I can't make a difference because look at all this big company. I can't, if I one vote's not going to make a difference, what di what does it make? And it it's quite a big thing. I feel like that not enough people talk about. Is there anything specific that you would want, if you were going to give it in a sentence, like encapsulate your point in a sentence and send it out there in the world to the next Prime Minister, what would it be? I say let people be and let them be themselves. Um, I feel like that makes a clear point. Hear us out first before, you know, you decide, before you speak, you know, whatever you say, like just hear us once. Uh, talk to us once or talk to like you know people who know about the stuff rather than assuming this is this or this is that and just going on and on about it i think i would talk a lot about um i think i give a speech on poverty that's what i do because i feel like i can bring a lot of my own personal story to that but also some fairly sort of some some fairly biting st statistics with that one that can't really be disputed or argued against. And I feel like ultimately that's something that no matter who gets in, they should hear it because both parties have allowed this system of debt and welfare to fall downhill since it was set up. And ultimately, I don't see it's going to get any better. That's what I do. I mean, I suppose we should say that, I mean, for all that we've been critical in taking these people apart, you know, they've been pretty decent public speakers, right? You know, it's a nervous, nerve wracking, difficult thing to do. They've stood up and they've given these speeches and it's been relatively coherent. But it's easy then to think that they did that because they're really, you know, they're good at it or they're experienced or they're posh or they've had certain jobs or certain educations. And as you and I know, and I think as we've been sort of showing by analysing the speeches, they've learned to do that. They've been taught and they've practised it. And it may well be that those speeches have been rehearsed. And what we found on our travels was that, yeah, you can bring anybody from a standing start, not sure what they want to say, not confident about saying it, to within a few hours, OK, maybe not as polished as these guys, um, but they haven't got all the resources and the time that these guys have. But actually articulating a case, 
advocating for a cause in a way that is you know, informing its audience, that is moving the audience, that can have memorable phrases, memorable lines. There are phrases from speeches that we saw people write a, a year ago that I still remember, right? That, that, because they so effectively encapsulated the point that person uh, wanted to make. So yeah, anybody can do it. Anyone can learn to become an advocate for a cause. And if not a, a professional politician kind of swanning around TV studios in Westminster, but a person who in their life, in their community, in their town is able to speak up for themselves and also speak out for the causes that, that they believe in. And that's something that everybody should have the opportunity to do. That's not just bad politicking. That's the essence of that, of, of political life, shaping a question, putting it to people, offering an answer, changing how we think about the problems and the situations we face and, and enthusing us to take part in making things different. Inspired by Max, I encourage you all to vote on the 4th of July for the MP you feel can make the changes that we need to see in this country. My deepest thanks to all the people who have shared their stories by writing speeches with us, and specifically on this podcast to Johnny and Max, Kate and Devika, and as always, thank you to our incredible partner, Professor Alan Finlayson. And thank you so much to Marie Horner, our podcast producer, who was so up for jumping in at the last minute to make this special Dash Arts General Election podcast. Our public house has been funded by a funding partnership from the Arts and Humanities Research Council, the Thistle Trust, the Arts Council England and Sri Monkeys Trust and many, many wonderful friends and individuals. If you want to know more about the project and our theatre production, our public house, which we're making from it, Head to dasharts.org.uk, read the blogs, listen to our previous podcasts on the production and sign up to our newsletter. If you like the Dash Arts podcast, please subscribe, like and tell all your friends about us. We'd love to hear from you. Your support means the world to us.